So we are exactly five past 12, so we can start our brief introduction on uh, the summer school. We reached the 10th edition, it's uh, a lot of time past flying for us. And I will give this presentation with Isabel Flores, who is the secretary general of our partner university. Here you can see one of the pictures <clears throat> of our nice groups. The next slide. So the European Drug Summer School was uh, initiated in uh, 2012 as a joint initiative between uh, the MCDDA and the Skete University in Lisbon. Up to now, we trained 500 students from 62 nationalities. A lot of groups of very interesting people. You will meet some of them today. Next slide, please. So what are the learning objectives and the activities we propose to our students? The overall objective is to learn together how to apply evidence for decision making. In doing that, we also show the strength of the weaknesses, especially of the evidence, and we show the synergies that the European Union has in place. Uh, the lectures are about two main topics, health and security. And in doing that, we clarify what is intended by the balanced approach, the European balanced approach to the problems of drugs. You use the EMCDA key indicators and the contents produced by our colleagues at the MCDDA, and we merge with students' presentations. So people come and share what are their projects and how they can use the information from the summer school to enhance their careers. And then we have the study visits, in particular to the Portuguese Commission for Dissuasion for outreach programs, methadone mobile units. You can see some pictures in these slides and then a harm reduction center, and more recently to a mobile uh, in drugs injecting room. Next slide. The course uh, includes tests and evaluation and credits. We have a 360 degrees evaluation system. We have daily working groups. And at the end of the course, students voluntarily can take a test that gives to them six credits. Uh, then there are satisfaction questionnaires by students and also the faculty and the keynote speakers are asked their impression. And we really change and base our programs yearly on these comments from, from all the participants. The next slide. The faculty is composed by mostly colleagues from EMCDDA, but also we always have uh, keynote speakers from the different disciplines interested. So uh, public policy, epidemiology, medicine, criminology, psychology. And here is a list of uh, some of the colleagues I'd like also to take an opportunity to greet, starting with Werner Sieb, past president of the International Narcotic Board. We had as a guest speaker, Alex Stevens, University of Ken, Alex Baldacchino, president of uh, International Society of Addiction Medicine, Anne Kuhn, Eva Hawk, Isabel, Mab eh, sorry, Florence Mabilo from the eh, Pompidou Group, Gabriele Fischer, also member of the MCDA eh, Scientific Committee, João Goulau, the Drugs Coordinator of Portugal, who is also at the center of the concluding debate on the drugs policy in Portugal, Keith Humphries from Stanford University, Lara Tavoski, Marta Torrens from Barcelona, Owen Bowden-Jones, Chair of the Advisory Council of the Misuse of Drugs, Robert West, former uh, Editor-in-Chief of Addiction, who has always been present to our uh, training, to our uh, summer schools, Sabrina Molinaro from the National Research Council in Italy, and others that, uh, that we don't have space to mention here are part of uh, this uh, family. The next slide. Scholarships are available. The ISKT, the partner university, offers co scholarship covering 50% of the total fee. And this is based on merit, travel costs, and the GDP of the candidate countries. But we have also other types of grants <clears throat> offered by the IPP 
um, S is K T, and there are two neighboring countries uh, projects uh, with the participation of the MCDDA, Europe for mo for um, monitoring drugs and IPA7 that are also offering uh, scholarships to their to their um, um, partner countries, and then there are agreements with the programs for early career uh, researchers with scientific societies, like, for example, the European Society for Prevention Research. The next slide. The program, every year we have a theme. For example, this year we will talk mainly about responses for vulnerable groups. Um, it's composed of two weeks, last week of June, first week of July. In the first week, we talk about drug problems like burden of disease, drug characteristics, drug use, harms and responses. While the second week is more about policies, laws, market and the use of evidence for decision making. And then we have a concluding debate with uh, uh, Mr. João Gulau talking about the application of the Portuguese uh, approach to drugs policy. And then we always have a social program. You can see one of the pictures. Uh, students in general have an intense <laughs> social uh, networking uh, number of events here in, in Portugal, and they follow up through the social networks, getting in contact and undertaking initiatives together. The next slide. The organizers, Isabel Flores, she will meet in a moment. Uh, Catherine Mouri, fundamental, she couldn't be here today for a competing um, commitment, but uh, she's assistant professors at the Nova University of Lisbon. And she was really one of the initiator of the summer school with other colleagues at the MCDA. I only joined, we only joined in 2015, if I'm not wrong. The next slide. So this is the distribution of our students. We really covered all the continent uh, with 62 nationalities represented. The next slide. Here, Alessandra represented where our students come from. You can see Portugal is highly represented, uh, sorry, Portugal and Europe is highly pre uh, represented, but not only. We had students from the United States, Brazil, uh, Canada, uh, and more. Pakistan, India, everywhere, more. Uh, sorry, the next slide. And now I leave the floor to Isabel to talk a little bit about the partner university. Thank you very much, Marika. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here. For us, it's such a pleasure to be co-organizing this initiative for 10 years. So we've joined at the beginning and curiously, the beginning of this summer school is our first activity in the Institute. Did you know that, Marika? No, so I didn't. We are, yes, we are also celebrating 10 years this year. Fantastic. So just now, just in March. And summer school was like our first big event. So we're so proud to, to join this initiative. And we always learn so much from this fantastic team of organizers and and. The, all sorts of people that cooperate, cooperate in this initiative. So the Public Policy Institute of Ishkte, that is, that is IPPS, uh, has this mission of bringing university and policy stakeholders together. So what we really do is we try to, to bring knowledge from university to policy stakeholders and the other way around. So the knowledge that is built in the terrain to be used by, by, our, by our researchers. So in this, this is a, a perfect example for this, where good practices joins theory and you know, we kind of interchange knowledge. Uh, we've been partners since early days. And um, I think this is a moment where we can really share practices and we can contribute for the improvement of policies in this area of drugs all over the world. And in the, the feedback we, we gain from our participants is that is that following the course, they, they take with them different views and you know some of them really get to the terrain. So the next slide, please. 
So fu fundamentally, our role is not scientific here, unless we are the, the bridge. We really act as the bridge. So I, I brought you Rodrigo and Cristina, who, is, who are the people who really make this happen. They really work very hard for, for everything to work, both on, on, a, on a physical manner and nowadays on this more uh, world in a square uh, world in a square manner, but it's been a very interesting experience and a very outreaching experience. The the online courses that we miss, we miss the parting and we miss, you know, coffee breaks and talking in the corridor and going out for dinner and and having this 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 beautiful sunset drink at at the at the office of um, of the, the 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 drugs the drugs the european drugs office in lisbon so we very much go through the organization of logistics and we manage the exams and above all we certify so we certify this uh, this uh, two weeks of intense work so thank you very much again, and it's such a pleasure to be here. I wish you a wonderful session and, of course, a wonderful summer school, which is coming in one month, more or less. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yes, very fast. We're almost there. Exactly. Not even one month because it starts end of June. So exactly. two or three weeks. So it's very, very fast coming. Thank you, Marika. Back to you. Thank you, Isabel. So Isabel mentioned already, <clears throat> in this partnership, we are very creative. So last year, when we were obliged to have the online edition of the summer school, we realized that there were a number of participants saying good that it is online, because otherwise we couldn't afford being two weeks out of work, two weeks out of home, etc. So we decided that from this year, <clears throat> 21 already, we had also a winter school that will remain always online, independently from the pandemics. And then the summer school will hopefully resume its face-to-face -face editions from last year. So as Isabel said, the end of this month, we will have a new <clears throat> group starting still online, but will be hopefully the the last summer school online. I thank you, everybody. I leave the floor to Alessandra Bo, who will be the chair for this, uh, for this uh, uh, webinar. And I will also close my camera to leave more space to see the others. Thank you very much. Alessandra is for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you for our guests here. So um, this is the 12th webinar that we are organizing at the EMCDDA on the 11th of June, celebrating 10 years of the summer school. I thought that was uh, really nice uh, numbers for us. And uh, so today we will be talking about the, the summer school and disseminating the European balanced approach on drugs through training. And uh, we've invited ex-students uh, of the summer schools to share with us in a very informal way, so no presentation. My next slide is the last one that you will see in this session, but really just to, to discuss with them. And we have, so Daria joining, Daria Piacentino joining us from the US. She's a visiting fellow in clinical psychoneuroendocrinology and neuropsychopharmacology in, uh, in NIDA. Uh, we also have Irena Molnar, she's the Executive Director of Regeneration in Serbia and Foundations Council member at Yoda, as well as steering committee, part of the steering committee of the Eurasian Harm Reduction Association. Uh, Shimon Pogorzelski uh, is a policy officer at the DG Home at the European Commission in Brussels. We also have uh, Rachel Tesh, hopefully I pronounce this well. She's an operations manager from St. George University of Beirut. Uh, so she's joining from Lebanon. And last but not least, Anton Gomez Escolar. He is a project manager at the international drug in the International Drugs Project Area for Energy Control, an NGO uh, based in Spain. He's also senior expert at the Commission on Global Drug Policies of UNAD and scientific analyst and advisor on psychedelics at Medicine Innovation and Mind Leap Health. So what are we going to do now? Just for our audience to know, we have really two questions that I will ask to our guests 
in the order <laughs> that I've introduced them. So Dario, for you to know that you'll be the first one to go. And as I said, really informal conversation to discuss about their experience at the summer school. The first one, will be about uh, the way in which the, their participation in the EMCDDA Drug Summer School supported their career development. And the second one, it's about uh, the way in which the, the balanced approach is reflected in your work and what is the legacy of the EMCDDA on, on their vision of uh, the future of drug-related issue. But um, we start with the first one, the easier one, <laughs> I think, about uh, how the summer school have uh, supported your career or have influenced or had a part in your career development. Before I let you speak, Daria, just let me stop sharing so we all see each other's. And yes, please. Thank you so much, Alessandra. Hi, everyone. So yes, I was um, I was a participant uh, of the MCDDA Drug Summer School in 2017, and uh, so first a bit of background. So I'm um, I'm an addiction psychiatrist. I I train in Rome. I I hold a PhD in neuroscience and a master's in uh, um, medical statistics. And uh, so when I attended the MCDDA Drug, Drug Summer School, I was um, in the last year of a psychiatry residency. And I think that um, the program shaped, shaped my career in fundamental, in, I would say three fundamental ways. And that's what I'm gonna tell you about. So first of all, I think that before attending uh, the drug summer school, my view of addiction psychiatry was mainly shaped by test books and academic papers. And it was mainly theoretical. And uh, I think that attending the drug summer school broadened like my views and rightfully so, and it exposed me to the real world, the world of practice and the world of, uh, of the complex policy challenges that, um, that Europe faces, but also in general, more, ex more extensively, the whole world faces. Because right now I'm in the US, I, I'm working, I've been working uh, as, um, as Alessandra mentioned, as a visiting fellow uh, for three years at the NIH specifically, at the joint lab of NIDA, a National Institute on Drug Abuse, and in a AAA, the National Institute on Alcohol Use um, and Alcohol Alcoholism. Uh, so this, I think, was the main like lesson I learned. Um, and as Marika said, you know, we have real exposure to injection sites, to the real world of drug users. Second, I think that MCDA gave me exposure to scientific experts. Uh, not only from, from the NCDA, but also from other fields, researchers, uh, practitioners, policymakers. And I had never had that exposure before. So that was enlightening, that was exciting. And it also gave me a wide network of contacts with other professionals that some became friends. So uh, we have here Irena and uh, Irena and Rachel were both uh, together with me at the, the MCDDA Drug Summer School. So that's amazing, we keep track of each other. Even during the pandemic, it has been so important. I think it's a great um, support system in general. And uh, I think this is, this is great. We really kind of keep track of each, keep, keep track of each other. And uh, the third thing is that MCDA inspired me to take, to take my career to the next level. Uh, it really pushed me. I think it was fundamental because uh, in applying to a position at the NIH and moving to the United States in that uh, soon after I attended MCDA Jack Summer School I, in 2017, then finished after I finished, soon after I finished my residency, I applied and, uh, and moved to the US. So thank you. This is great. This was thank great. Thank you. Well, that, that was good <laughs> to know. Um, Irena, can I ask you then? <laughs> Hi, yeah, thank you, Alessandra, thank you, Marika, and everybody else for the warm welcome and for inviting me to, to be a part of this event. I'm at most uh, happy to see two of my fellow uh, uh, alumni from the summer school, and yeah, it's been amazing to follow up what you girls have been doing since the summer school. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, um, the, as uh, Daria also started, I would give you a little bit of background. So when I uh, applied for the summer school, actually Cecile Martel from Marito's department of the MCDDA, she used to be, I, I'm not sure if she's still in that department, but she actually uh, promoted summer school to me since she was aware that I was 
uh, a master I have a hold a master in social anthropology and also political science and European integration of the Western Balkans to EU. So when we discussed of my interest, it was up for me applying for summer school, and uh, I did. So at the time, I was working in drug policy network Southeast Europe, and I was foundation council board member of youth organization for drug action in Europe, which I'm still holding that position. And uh, yeah, I've been a lot of, uh, uh, I was participating uh, in the process of uh, uh, establishing the new drug policy and the current strategy and drug, uh, strategy and action plan uh, on drugs in the Republic of Serbia, representing young people, representing harm reduction, and representing community. And uh, it's been really important for me to get on that part of the EU being able to discuss one on one and in the group with the European and other world experts on what actually being in the European Union means for us, because I come from Serbia, and how actually our national laws are going to be harmonized uh, within the EU laws in order to become, uh, to, in order to respect the process that we have to, and in order to become uh, a, a member of EU family as we are on that way. So in the terms of, uh, uh, in the terms of uh, uh, some, what summer school offered to me, that was really one of the most valuable uh, things I uh, took with me in Serbia. And after I came back, uh, uh, I uh, became uh, executive director of NGO Regeneration, which I worked before for seven years. And I also was a part of the working groups uh, and still am and uh, uh, have and developed the lovely cooperation with the Ministry of Health and Office for Combating Drugs in the burning questions that we are having in Serbia. And that cooperation also uh, uh, that cooperation also is something that I uh, kind of brought from Portugal in order because I kind of learned what are the types of discussions that I should have with my government in order to bring the most of what I learned and most of what we have back home. So yeah, thank you once again. Thank you. For thank that you. Thanks. Thanks, Irina. Thank you a lot. May I ask now then Shimon? <laughs> A Hello. very recent Hi. student, yeah. I just learned that you were in our online <laughs> summer school last year. Yes, so I guess I'm the test case for the winter drug school for the online only uh, version. So if I may, um, my name is Shimon Pogorzelski and I work for the unit on organized crime, drugs and corruption. This is part of the law enforcement and security directorate within the directorate of the law enforcement and security uh, within part of the, the the migration and home affairs uh, directorate general which is part of the commission uh, european commission also known as dg home now dg home mainly focuses on security and migration however the drugs policy is very special to us because we are in charge of coordination for broad aspects of uh, drugs policy within the European Commission. Now, uh, that goes way beyond security and includes prevention, harm reduction, capacity building, health, research, and many others. The day-to-day -day, uh, management of drugs policy within the European Commission takes place in the framework of inter-service group on drugs policy, where more than 20 commission services, uh, the European External Action Service and EMCDDA, the, the, the colleagues from the Drugs Agency, the Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drug Addiction, regularly meet to discuss topics relevant to, to drugs policy. At EU level, if we go beyond the European Commission, the drugs policy is coordinated at a horizontal drugs group, which is a council configuration called working group, where all member states regularly discuss and take action on issues relevant to EU drugs policy. And this is a gathering where key decisions are taken in this regard. 
The Horizontal Drugs Group meets every month or two, and its proceedings are chaired by the Council Presidency, currently uh, the Portuguese authorities. I think the name of the chair was mentioned <laughs> before, um, but this is to say the world of drugs seems to be a small one. Uh, I, I know some of these faces that you mentioned from the Horizontal Drugs Group. And given the scope of the drugs policy, member states are typically represented by the Ministries of Interior, relevant to what we used to call supply reduction, and Ministries of Health, the demand side. And the key stakeholder for us in the European Commission is EMCDDA, the, the Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drug Addiction, which is the center for European expertise on challenges relevant to illicit drugs. We also work closely with Europol and other relevant stakeholders. And at the international level, the relevant bodies in this regard are the United Nations notably and the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. And so the EU efforts at the international stage are complementing what we do at the EU, EU level. And one important stakeholder to consider in this regard is civil society, and we cooperate strongly, closely with civil society, mainly through the Commission Expert Group, Civil Society Forum on Drugs. Now, this introduction, I would say it's relevant because to answer the question of, of, um, of what, uh, 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 to answer the question in the panel, this participation of the EMCDDA in the EMCDDA Drug Summer School allowed me to develop a coherent, complement, a complete view on all aspects of drugs policy, which is very much needed to have a background, to have a context of the various elements of the drugs policy that we do uh, in the European Commission. So the lectures, workshops, and discussions provided in the drug summer school are indeed um, an excellent uh, to give uh, overview, a uh, solid overview of, of various aspects of, of the issues at hand in the field of drugs. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Shimon. I mean, literally, I have goosebumps because it's so rewarding to hear you guys. Because, <laughs> you know, we do it when we put enthusiasts, but uh, to show, you know, what the results, it, it's really nice to hear about your results. Anyway, let's stick to the program. Rachel, can I ask then you how the summer school has influenced somehow or contributed to your career? Definitely. Thank you again for having me uh, among the panelists. I'm very happy to see you again, all of you. Um, it was really a great opportunity for me to, to come uh, in person <laughs> before COVID when we were in, uh, along with Irina and uh, Daria. Um, so a little bit of uh, uh, how did I get introduced to the program? So it was I, I was uh, really uh, recently appointed to, uh, to my position at the Ministry of Public Health uh, at the National Observatory on Drugs and Drug Addiction. We were setting it up. So and I was freshly graduated from my master's in public health in epidemiology and biostatistics. So it was kind of like a whole new field jumped over my shoulders. <laughs> And uh, I was introduced from the first day uh, that I started my uh, job, my assignment. Um, we met with uh, colleagues from EMCDDA, Sandrine and Gonzalo, and they introduced uh, the program to like really help in uh, getting me more into the, the field of uh, uh, exposure and uh, more from the technical aspect and some administrative aspects, of course. Uh, so uh, when I came and and uh, definitely the part the fun part is there. <laughs> we we met colleagues. Uh, we stayed connected. Became friends. Uh, uh, it was really a, a great opportunity there. Uh, but of course, uh, career perspective, it gave me a big push uh, first to like have uh, the necessary tools to. Um, provide support uh, in my work back in Lebanon. Um, this, is, this was very fundamental to my career. Uh, we got to publish afterwards uh, several reports and uh, within the summer school, uh, after having the exposure and, and with the connections of the TMCDDA and the Ishkete provided, uh, so we we're able to like send the reports for review and uh, to help out in all the like uh, kind of put them as achievements at, at some point uh, of that that phase uh, more than this it actually helped uh, also shaped uh, 
my vision and perspective on how uh, such an issue is being handled at uh, not only a national level, but at a global level, because uh, the mix of candidates uh, of students, <laughs> uh, we were students uh, there, uh, is really like you get to hear the different perspectives from everywhere. What issues are they having? Are they common issues? Can we solve them together? Uh, so that we can hear different perspectives from other colleagues in different countries, how they are handling their own um, uh, uh, tasks. So this was really a big uh, plus to, to push uh, my career forward. Um, I am a bit now shifted towards not really focus on drugs or substance use, but it's still like uh, formed uh, the necessary like perspective on things. So I'm, uh, it gave me this overview for uh, on from the health management perspective, which really uh, pushed me forward uh, beyond my like expectations in my career. <laughs> to uh, handle like big projects at uh, a national level and uh, more of a regional level sometimes. In short. <laughs> excellent, <laughs> excellent. Lot, really good to know. To and congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. So um, last but not least, Anton, please tell us. <laughs> Hi, hello. <laughs> well, uh, Thank you, Alessandra. Uh, my name is Anton Gomez Escolar, and I, part, I took part in the European Drug Summer School of the year 2018. Uh, I applied both at the um, uh, European Drug Summer School and uh, to be a trainee at the MCDDA. Uh, but my first intention was to attend the, the European Drug Summer School, and thankfully, I was uh, accepted in both. So it was a great opportunity for me to, to learn a lot and to improve my, my career. Um, at the time I, I applied for it, I was heavily uh, volunteering on harm reduction field with different uh, organizations that were providing uh, information and drug checking in, in music festivals and other, and other venues and also providing um, services in the area of prevention. That was the specific topic of my year uh, at the European Drug Summer School. I just graduated from a master in international relations and also a master in psychopharmacology and illegal drugs. So I was very keen to, to, to explore this space and get the most out of uh, all the knowledge that I, I could get from, from drug policy and, and how the how European, how European Union was working in, in this regard at the time. Um, thanks to all the knowledge I get from there, I could um, broaden a lot my, my knowledge on how the, how the European Union and the different countries approach the topic of, of, of drugs and drug policy. It gave me a, a better understanding of the European drug policies and the role, specific role of the MCDA and the balance approach, which is something we will talk about later. Um, it also gave me a lot of new ideas on where I could uh, direct my, my professional development uh, after it and uh, gave me a lot of networking opportunities, which is something of, of extreme value, I would say, from the European Drug Summer School, this opportunity to, to, to get together with, with other professionals and people that is interested in, in this field and exchange views, learn a lot from other regions of the world, because as Marika, as Marika said before, this is not only a, a, an activity for Europeans, it, it attracts people from different regions that can also learn and share their point of view and their experience from their own countries. Um, I would say it also wider my perspective a lot, which uh, for me is very important because thanks to this, I, could, uh, I was appointed as a member of the uh, Global Drug Policy Commission on UNAD, the National Spanish uh, Addiction Network, and uh, help them with all the topics that are related with European drug policies that, that I think are crucial for, for how we approach uh, the drug issues in, in Spain. Um, it also helped me to understand the importance of prevention, human rights, public health, and above all, the, the need for evidence when it comes to developing or proposing any, any policy advocacy or try to get something uh, to become law and to become a, an impact in, in people's daily life. So in, I would say it, it was extremely, extremely helpful. And above all, 
it was very fun, very educational. And I would say that I'm really looking forward to have an alumni event. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Duly noted <laughs> for the event. We will try to organize it. We were discussing it beforehand also with Marika. But uh, OK, so thank you all for, for this first round. Let's go and then to the second round. It's a question that I, I personally really curious to know, because uh, the one thing that I'm noticing here, uh, many of you mentioning it, it's, it's, it's the global reach <laughs> of this uh, summer school, which I think it's absolutely enriching. And also the fact that we are reaching out to young uh, professional that will shape up the future of what we're talking now, the drug policies and drug interventions. So the second question addresses uh, partly this and is in which way the balanced approach is reflected in your work and also what is the legacy of the EMCDDA on your vision of uh, the future of a uh, drugs related issue. And so if we start again from Daria. Sure, yes. Uh, so I'm really happy to reply to this question because I think that uh, so the European balance approach is in, in I think is, is in real harmony with what I do now at NIDA and also with the NIDA paradigm of addiction. And I think the main legacy of uh, the MCDDA and, and more specifically the drug summer school for me is to um, is basically what we can do more in terms of like uh, community-based efforts to prevent substance use and, uh, and harm reduction. Uh, so I, I'm, I work in a lab, so my, pers my perspective is basically a development of new treatments, and this is like NIDA's focus. But uh, what I'm very proud is that um, this year for the first time we had, so every year we, um, uh, NIDA sponsors the, what is called the National Drug and Alcohol Facts Week, which is a week dedicated to linking teenagers with experts and science-based information about drug. And, and it's a great idea. There are many initiatives. But I was very happy to see that uh, this past year, uh, thanks to the contribution of, uh, co of many colleagues and myself, uh, it was very successful in uh, educating teens uh, comprehensively uh, by also mentioning scientifically proven uh, harm reduction te techniques that, for, for example, can keep uh, teenagers safe if they ever cho choose to use drugs or if they're around someone who does. And for me, that is a great legacy because uh, I really took what I knew from what I learned at the NCDA Junk Summer School and, and managed to kind of integrate uh, the European approach with you know, what I know from that with what happens in the United States because that's where I, I work. So I think it's really amazing how we can you know, integrate approaches. Excellent, excellent. Thanks. Irena? Yeah, uh, thank you, Alexandra. Uh, uh, yeah, what you just mentioned is uh, youth. And since I have been working and representing youth since the beginning of my drug policy career, if I can say so, that is now almost 10 years long. Uh, yeah, I can proudly say that yeah, we as a youth in EMCDDA summer school, some of us really took an effort on an international stage, for example, in uh, at CND at United Nations. And I have been following with some of my colleagues that uh, I've been uh, alumni at the MCDDA summer school. And it's been great because uh, we did learn a lot of things in how European Union functions, but we also got influenced by, for example, Canada or uh, stories from the States. And we, even though we uh, didn't have chance to work maybe on some of the projects we did and we are continuing developing and discussing and uh, brainstorming the ideas on how we can based on evidence that we see in our communities improve uh, things on a policy level influencing the better service provision, for example, in my case, service provision and harm reduction back to my community. Serbia. So yeah, based on that, uh, yeah, I think that the uh, youth and future generations of European, sum, uh, European summer school are going to shape up things. And uh, trust me, I know a few of the young people who are really into learning, into getting to know people, into uh, getting the most of the things that you offer. And I, be I believe that the future is going to be bright for all of us. And I believe that the younger generations are specifically keen, I think they're, 
I, as I work with young people and uh, I lead now a team of 22 young professionals that are mostly from disadvantaged communities, but also uh, researchers and professionals and uh, key target population represent representatives, I can honestly say that I did pass some of the legacy of summer school and some of the things that I learned in specifically discussion with the older professionals that usually young people do not really know how to do. So basically, yeah, uh, being uh, somebody for them to look up to, I can proudly say that youngers, youngsters are going to rock our world, definitely. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Thank you, Irena. Shimon. Yes, thank you. So this is to say that for me, the most important element of this EU approach, which I strengthened through the drug summer school is the concept of evidence-based integrated balance and multidisciplinary approach to the drugs phenomenon, which also incorporates gender equality and, 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 uh, and health equity perspective. So this approach, which aims to protect and improve the well-being of society and of the individual to protect and promote public health and to offer also a high level of security and well-being of the general public. So this is very important that it goes beyond the remit of security. And there is a complex set of issues at hand here, especially, and I'm saying it, working for law enforcement and security directorate. Now, this is to say that um, the, the, the drug summer school was also helpful to me a bit more personally because I'm an economist by training. So I'm a not uh, necessarily a drugs expert as such, as many of you, if not most here in this virtual room, but my main responsibility is to actually link the drugs policy objectives to funding instruments and to support via European funds these policy objectives. So what I learned in the school was, was very helpful to set this evidence-based balance and multidisciplinary approach to the drugs phenomenon. Now, the second part of your question on it comes to legacy. Um, there is this concept of train the trainer uh, in the project applications that we often see. And this is to say that to pass the knowledge we learn and by saying we, what we have as a concept is that we try to send a colleague from European institutions every year, if possible, to this year uh, EMCDA drug summer school. So the colleague, in that case, me, uh, in this first virtual uh, uh, session of the, of the school, learns what he or she has learned and then passes the knowledge forward in the echo of the, of the European institutions by, by giving its, uh, myself a, a training on the key elements that, uh, that I learned. And I can say that we will try to continue doing so. So we hope to see a colleague from the European institutions, be it the, the commission or perhaps the external action service in the subsequent years to come. And this colleague will try to gather these elements back home and to take it into account when driving the EU policy in, in, in the context of, of drugs. Thank you. Thank you, Shimon. That's really, really nice to hear. And of course, colleagues are always welcome. <laughs> and I like this echoing uh, or trainers of trainers aspect of it all. I think uh, we really mean it as a, as a goal. Uh, Rachel, your turn. Thank you. Thank you again, Alessandra. Not to add up to what, what my colleague said, uh, but of course there are a lot of uh, resonating ideas uh, together. Uh, so back to Beirut, <laughs> uh, there was, I think, a big step forward um, in the whole like substance use drugs uh, policy uh, issue at, at the national level. Uh, we've made a lot of progress along with the National Mental Health Program. Uh, we're leading on that with the, the strategy on substance use. Uh, so we got to implement several strategic objectives. Uh, again, the drug summer school helped me be very well equipped to uh, really um, implement uh, many components of the, the strategy that we had put along with the main stakeholders. Um, of course, with the help of uh, Pompidou Group, who were on board all the time to uh, uh, really uh, uh, fund the, the, this initiative because we really um, had no evidence whatsoever uh, like publicly available for um, uh, for sharing at, at a national level so it was really some groundwork some basic work 
that we moved on really um, uh, um, like we had a, a big shot ahead. And we were ahead in also reforming some of the, uh, at the law and policy level. But unfortunately, things got really messed up recently <laughs> with the political uh, uh, situation. And um, now that it has moved a bit slow, uh, slower on the agenda at the government level. However, at the non-governmental level, the NGOs are really active. Uh, so there are, there are several uh, NGOs that are really benefiting from those uh, uh, reports that were published. Uh, one of them is also related to uh, highlight the gender issue. We had uh, some uh, research on the women's, um, like how, how are they affected uh, in general in Lebanon? What are their needs with uh, who, who are um, uh, being like in rehab for substance use disorders? So uh, we tackled several aspects and uh, there were uh, laws. So uh, an act was issued in 2018, if I'm not mistaken to like depenalize uh, harm reduction. Um, so th th there is still some activity on the non-governmental level that the uh, stakeholders are benefiting from, but uh, it has slowed down a bit on uh, the like national agenda. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. I hope things get better <laughs> soon <laughs> we, hope, we hope so anton oh sorry uh, oh no just uh, sweet please uh, please please a please. last comment uh, uh regarding like the balanced approach as well um i wanted to comment on uh really the importance of bridging this um uh, theory to practice when we w uh, visited the centers uh moraria in and uh, the several drop-in centers in Portugal, we had like a really hands-on experience. And this, is, this was fundamental to really have those concepts stick in, uh, in our heads to apply it wherever we are. Like for now, uh, for example, we're developing the curriculum for the Faculty of Medicine and there is a component like related to public health, substance use. So kind of from a managerial level, uh, well, I'm looking at, I have this like big perspective now and I can know where to integrate what. And this, is, this was really, um, I think, the take home message that I got from the yeah, MCD, from the drug summer school. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so we move to Anton. Tell so, us. well, uh, to me, this idea of uh, balancing public health with uh, public safety and known as balanced approach is a very important take home message. One, probably one of the most important messages that I got from the European Drug Summer School and my experience at the NCBDA. Um, and it also comes hand, hand to hand, in my opinion, with uh, this idea of the importance of having very good evidence to be able to provide evidence based policies because. This field of drugs uh, tends to be like uh, very prone to sensationalistic uh, movements and populistic policies, and this is extremely harmful when it comes to to the approach of drugs and especially to the drug users themselves and the human rights. So this idea of having uh, a balanced approach in the core of the European drug policies and trying to build this on top of really nice uh, evidence-based policies. Is, is probably the, the most important orientation that we could have um, as, as different countries and in different governments. Um, going to myself, um, I now was a community manager of uh, in, international drug pro projects at Energy Control. I try to, to, to take this approach and to, and to understand better how this European Union drug strategy builds on this idea of the balanced approach in order to provide uh, the best solutions possible and to suggest the best uh, possible international projects so we can we can fit on this idea and this strategy as and, and have interesting uh, international projects that could be that could be useful for for drug users in in regards to harm reduction and to improve their their well the quality of life and and, the, and their safety um, and I would say all, all this is, uh, is crucial for, 
for the way uh, we understand uh, the drug problems now in, in Europe. And thanks to this, uh, to this experience that we had at the, at the European Drug Summer School, uh, we could learn better what are the fundamentals uh, of having a very good balanced approach in order to have a better uh, public safety, public health, and uh, go away from, from some areas in some countries that are having more uh, populistic based policies or less uh, or that are less uh, um, based on on on, on good uh, drug evidence or public policy excellent excellent thank you i mean i'm i'm, I'm really well, proud now <laughs> of, of being on organizers of the summer school and i especially liked that uh, i mean one of i mean the main legacy is really the, the balanced approach that is the one thing that i think we should all be proud as uh, as europeans in terms of drug policy but i especially liked your mention of evidence i think all of you mentioned it and um Marika is back online, but with Marika, we are managing the best practice portal where we are stressing since 10 years the importance of evidence and collecting it and promoting it. So really, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Marika, back to you. Yes, there is uh, one question, a difficult question from, uh, from Guus Krutz from uh, Trimbush Institute in the Netherlands, asking perhaps you can give a good example about how evidence has influenced policy that is, has promoted evidence-based policy. I think all of you more or less mentioned something, but would you like to, to, to answer this question? Please, Irena. Yeah, the, the most recent event, in order to answer that question, I will just explain the most recent event that also is something that uh, uh, more recently we're working with the women who are using drugs uh, in cases of violence. And since uh, five months ago, we started doing that project because we felt in a field that women who experienced violence and did have uh, connections with drugs or, or, or anything similar, alcohol, for example, didn't have anywhere to go to. So when we ask the information from, for example, the Office for Combating Drugs or Ministry of Health, there is no single document or single data on women who are using drugs. So that, except if they are sex workers, uh, and that was the research in 2013. So what we did in the first place we did the policy analysis and then we went to shelters and social care facilities that usually work with women who experience violence to ask them in a field like, what do you need? Do you have, do you have these cases? Uh, do you need some guidance, some help? Do you know anything about drugs in the first place? So what we received as a response is that from 1,548 social case workers, none of them received any uh, training on drugs, drug use, and associated issues. So therefore, right now, I'm proud to say that the uh, protocols are being drafted and the gender equality uh, law is being accepted. And few of the comments that we have on the protocols in work with the women who, who are drug users are being in place. And soon, I hope by the end of the year, the shelters, officially run shelters, will be available them as well. So this is just one small example on how actually we did and ask people who are actually working with them, what do you need? Because protocols are in place, the law is in place, but practice is something that always concerns me when it comes to Serbia. So what I learned uh, also partially because of the particip participation in the summer school that practice and policy doesn't really is not really the same thing and that we need to go and meet those people out there, ask them, what do you need to better do your job? What is the thing? Is that the knowledge, the training, the experience? What is that? So yeah, luckily, this is how we managed to do one of the things that we are doing right now. So yeah, basically, experience is something important. Thank you. This is illuminating. I think it touched upon the problem of implementation of interventions and also listening and getting closer to our customers. Anybody else wants to answer this? Uh, the, the person who requested is very satisfied with your, <laughs> with your answer, Irena. But if there are any other examples, we would like to, to hear them. Uh, 
I could share um, yeah. an example of how evidence uh, shaped uh, or influenced uh, one like policy, but it was uh, also more uh, more than evidence. So th the start is the collecting the data and uh, uh, putting it there, but also uh, advocating for it. So it is. A, it was a collective effort that led to, uh, and, and it spanned over several years to really depenalize the uh, uh, harm reduction, the the use of of uh, substance. So in in our uh, law currently in Lebanon, uh, if anyone is caught by the police officer, uh, like just for substance use, not for uh, substance like. Um, uh, dealing or um, trafficking, they are uh, penalized by the law. So this was like worked for many years to really depenalize uh, the, the, the use of, of substances and send the people to rehab because at the emergency uh, room, uh, sometimes people were really afraid of reporting to the emergency department or emergency room because they were afraid to get uh, caught by the police. Uh, so this was a really big issue uh, to work around that. Um, fortunately, there were a lot of advocates for that cause. It started by like having advocacy groups, but then like one thing led to the other with the existence of evidence and with the, like having the, those reports out uh, data publicly more publicly available uh, for uh, lobbying for uh, use by several actors and several actors coming together uh, really helped in making that decision out this is one aspect of influencing the policy there were other like uh, really re uh, revising the whole uh, drugs law in lebanon uh, but it's still, the comment sections are still in the comment because <laughs> things have uh, uh, taken a different course now and the agenda in the parliament is, is different now. But uh, there is more um, awareness, I can say, at the, at the government level that we need to rely on evidence for the decision made a lot of politics in, in that part. I'm, I'm talking from my experience at the government level, but sometimes it's, it's easier to implement and um, faster uh, to implement probably small policies at like some uh, NGOs or a center uh, on a private part. So um, I hope this was another uh, example for, for you. An excellent example, also, also letting us know that this is a continuous process. You never reach exactly. your ultimate goal. It's a continuous and, and, and a very um, comprehensive process. Anybody else wants to, to contribute to this uh, um, bringing um, examples? Anton. Very briefly, I would like to mention that um, it's very interesting how the, the the experience with alternative models, like the one that was uh, done by Portugal, especially in, in the early 2000s, is a, set a good example and, and a good evidence base for, for new countries or new regions of the world to follow decriminalized approaches and other alternative uh, ways of treaty of managing drug problems that uh, now can be considered evidence-based because it's, they, are, they are building on, on the evidence that is being provided by, by, by this uh, policy practice in other countries. And this is an interesting example on, on whether um, the evidence that is, is bring by, by political uh, new uh, adventures uh, can, can also be used as evidence for, for, new, for new political uh, developments in the area of drugs that, that are not considered in the first place and later become really good examples on, on whether to have effective drug policies that protect uh, public health and and human rights. Thank you. Irena. I have just one small remark as we're talking about the evidence, about the data we're collecting, that we should always be careful in 
uh, how we are keeping that information, how we're interpreting that information, because as we, mo in most of the cases, we always have, as a researcher, we always have the good intention. We always have uh, improvement in our mind, but we also need to be careful that we concern all of the ethical issues possible that somebody might use it opposite of what we uh, firstly thought. So uh, for, for me specifically, we had, I think, one of the discussion on ethics in summer school, and I think I brought it since then. And we're always discussing that issue on if we are doing the research, how the data will be used, how it will be processed, usual researcher uh, discussion. But then we are also discussing how results will be used. Then can that jeopardize the key target population that we are working with? Are we disclosing something that can possibly make them more vulnerable than they already are? So these are the questions that are developing in my mind since then, and I always just when we're talking about evidences, when we're talking about the data, I always have this small remark to have in, a, in our mind because not always everybody has a good intention. So just that. If there are no other contribution on, on the question on evidence, this uh, last annotation by Irena, brings directly to another question that is not really in the context of this webinar, but I think it's still interesting to get. And it is about the emergency, the COVID-19 emergency that has created a lot of troubles, especially to our vulnerable target population, but also gave some new opportunities. And I think it links with what you were saying, Irena, because, for example, all the use of uh, technology and the, what, even what we are doing here now, it would have costed time and, and travels and, and so it is much easier but still there are some ethical considerations that need to be brought in mind so can you touch uh, what are the opportunities and, and challenges that the recent um, uh, emergency has brought in your career because we had as EMCDDA we had reports on what has happened in Europe uh, due to the, the emergency, but it's interesting to know individually what this has brought and, and how it can be reflected in the future when hopefully this emergency will be all. Who wants to start? Shimon, please. Happy. So thank you again, Shimon Pogorzowski, European Commission. Uh, I think one example, very concrete and perhaps helpful to some of the participants of today's virtual meeting of how we practically are able to address and how we are trying to address the emerging challenges in the uh, related to the phenomenon of, of, of drugs is that through the instruments that we have at place, the toolbox that we have at place, one of the tools that we do is the call for proposals. So we um, publish every year, every two years, depending on the fund, um, a number of initiatives, funding initiatives that the candidates, the future beneficiaries can apply for. And in there specifically, in the conditions, once the pandemic hit, we entered the elements related to the new phenomena, new challenges, and new ways of addressing these phenomena, And by doing so, we encourage the applicants to address these emerging challenges, such as, for instance, our online um, uh, outreach to both illicit uh, drug trafficking, but also prevention and harm reduction measures that could be, some of them in certain cases, in certain aspects, provided, supported, even strengthened by the online means. So uh, we, we, we do already see this resonated well with the, with the applicants and um, uh, let's say we, we can adjust to a good extent the funding that we have available and member states can do that as well. So this is one way of addressing this new phenomenon. Thank you. Yeah, one of the remarks that the participants in the summer school always give is that we are very lucky in Europe to have these synergies where we have the evidence, where we have funds for research that also draw on the evidence and the existing gap. So it's really 
recently our director said drugs are everywhere presenting the EDR. And I would say, and professionals interested in drugs are everywhere as well. And they really have an opportunity to merge their knowledge for, for actuating some synergies. Any other experiences? Anton, you were very active on, during the COVID-19 emergency. We saw you also with the suit of the Red Cross, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, well, I, I was involved in, in the response here in Spain in the in the hospitals that were built for, for the pandemic and everything. And also as, as a harm reduction professional here, I we we suffer and we also had the opportunity uh, both at the same time of uh, adjusting our way of working because this uh, COVID-19 was such a big uh, change in our operate, operative uh, way of working, especially the outreach, the outreach and the and the possibility to to connect with a population of drug users in different areas that were not the, the parties or the or the places where we would usually find them. Uh, but it was interesting because uh, in one hand we lose part of the um, of the usual connection with them, but in the other we get to explore new ways, as, as you were mentioning, technological uh, measures, uh, social networks, um, very challenging uh, experience, but it also brings us uh, these opportunities of, of finding ways to keep the contact with uh, drug users that are not the traditional ones. Also, um, there is a big opportunity when it comes to data data collection uh, for for these evidence based policies and for these um well for for having conclusions to to the, to do studies as well because using technological means uh, helps you to analyze and to have a better uh, knowledge on who is receiving your message um uh, if if they are like uh, implementing changes in their daily habits because of the message so you, it gives you a, a whole set of new tools as uh, simon was mentioning that that uh, increases the, the 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 possibility of you to to extract information of on on whether your 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 usual way of connecting with them is is effective is not and, and what are the, the things that must be kept after the covid pandemic as as good practices for for a future to to stick to them anyone else that wants to to mention something I think Alessandra has spotted a question from the from the audience already. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, there is a question actually from the audience. So I will save mine afterwards. Is um, if harm reduction has become an established part of Spanish policy? I think it's for you, Anton. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> I hope it has. No, um, I think Spain has um, a very nice uh, orientation towards harm reduction. Uh, there is a very strong um, social network and uh, a, a lot of uh, social organizations that are working on harm reduction right now, especially in, in the field of um, nightlife harm reduction and party night, uh, harm reduction, that those are probably the ones ones that have been more hit by, by the pandemic, as, as anyone could understand. But um, um, thanks to, to, the, um, to the national uh, drug policy, uh, consist well, the Plan Nacional sobre Drogas, uh, that is the, Sp the Spanish uh, national body on, on drugs, um, it has been um, supporting harm reduction more and more, I would say, in the in the last decades uh, since the the 80s, when when everything started with the heroin pandemic here, and uh, the first harm reduction policies got to to get into place, and there was evidence coming from them showing that it was a very effective uh, way of preventing the spread of of. Uh, of infectious disease, especially, and also to preventing deaths. And there were also some policies uh, connecting the well, the possibility of people in prisons to have a better, better healthcare and and prevent them from relapsing after leaving the prisons. And all this was a very, very nice uh, basis for starting um, a better approach to harm reduction in the in the next decades. That is the one that I'm, we are seeing now. And we, we, we feel that uh, even though we still would like to have more resources, uh, we are very welcomed by, by the population and, and by, the, by the users. And we are um, 
quite effective in in the in our message gets to the to the to the users and th and all of this is thanks also to the to the support of of, of the government and and the different uh, governmental uh, agencies that uh, are increasingly um, supporting harm reduction not always but most of the time we have this uh, this uh, collaborative work towards uh, public safety and safety of drug users uh, so in uh, uh, I would say that yes, we have, we're having like uh, a more uh, established uh, harm reduction approach in drug policies here in Spain. Thank you, Ale. Your other question from the my other question because it, it's a burning question that I had since Difficult. we started thinking <laughs> about it uh, about this webinar with Marika because because of of you actually because as I mentioned before uh, you are the young generation out there of. Uh, of uh, practitioner, what we call practitioner in the drug field and in cocktail, even with even younger generation like you, Irena. And so my question is, what do you think is the future <laughs> for drugs? And I mean, oh, I think everything, you know, we are witnessing, I think uh, really a big change. You know, these, this agency was um, set up in the eighties. So with the heroin and that is, as has changed, we are witnessing a bit, think more normalization of drug use. We presented on Wednesday, the new EDR. So our report and Marika mentioned it, our director said drugs are everywhere. Uh, not just in terms of the market being resilient to COVID, no COVID, <laughs> they're still there. But also I think in the terms of use, we all know, and we are monitoring also the changes in the cannabis policies, cannabis regulation around the world. So what do you think? <laughs> Where are we going? Uh, if I may. Anton, I, please. Uh, I think um, drugs, uh, well, the problem on, on drugs that we usually is the, the common approach that we have it uh, towards drugs as a problem. Um, I think uh, there is a general shift on on the way the people is is perceiving this this uh, this problem. Let's say because uh, for a lot of time we have had a lot of uh, moral approaches to drugs and ethical approaches to drugs that were stressing whether this was morally right or morally wrong. Or but I think more and more uh, this uh, a little bit more scientific. A more secular uh, way of seeing life and issues is uh, getting into the populations and people are starting to see drugs as what they are that they are tools that can be very harmful but they can also be helpful in some situations so uh, we're having more of a neutral approach to drugs and i think this is translating into the policy level little by little and and we're having these movements uh, of that are asking for decriminalization for regulation and even in, in some cases for medical use or even recreational use for some su substances as you mentioned like cannabis so uh, in my opinion i think the the future of drugs holds uh, a slow but steady movement towards uh, regulation in some areas of the world that are becoming more secular when it comes to approaching these these uh, these um, issues and probably this is gonna end up with having a a regulated market with this with a very strict um, way of accessing it like it is and, or it should be with with some substances uh, pharmaceutical substances right now uh, as an example but not uh, the kind of war on drugs approach that we were having in the last years that uh, if we if we go to the evidence uh, it doesn't make sense when it comes to public safety public health and uh, economic expenditure, uh, criminal uh, criminal problems, all of this, I think is showing us if we are neutral enough to see this data without uh, any moral um, implications, that uh, we need to change this model. And I think this is little by little getting into the, into the population and probably into the, into the governments uh, very soon. It looks like we have lost Rachel. Any other contribution on this? Uh... Rachel is back. Good. <laughs> Any other contribution? I can shortly say that yeah, I totally agree with what Anton said for the global level and global situation with the drugs. As we are seeing in the past 10 years, a really big change. So yeah, I only believe that it is going to continue developing in that way. And with more knowledge and more possibilities to learn, that will be even more successful in ways that we are like 
as as a human race, we are safe in what we're doing. But for region that I come from, so Western Balkans and Serbia, I honestly believe and want to believe that future of drugs in Western Balkans is actual acknowledgement of harm, harm reduction in the first place, um, actual improvement of treatment and services offered to people who are using drugs and lowering the stigma and discrimination that we face every day, as well as uh, possibility to have drug checking services as we are witnessing MPS also in the Western Balkans. So uh, the, it's a huge difference in between Serbia and Spain. And uh, yeah, I'm thankful for the opportunity to learn every day from the colleagues such as that as well. Thank you. Any, any, anybody else wants to, to say something on this future? of uh, your profession. Okay. I would like just to very briefly mention the big threat that now this nationalistic and populistic movements in some areas of the world is, is, uh, is bringing to the drugs area because some of them are using a lot of uh, sensationalistic drug policies that are for, from the past, let's say, and there some of them are becoming. So what I was mentioning is most for the for the Western world right now, but uh, we, we don't know other parts of the world might be going in, in a different direction. So I just want to clarify that. Thank you. So if there are no other comments by the other participants, we can probably look towards the conclusion. Uh, I really would like to thank you a lot for having spent some time with you with us today. Um, it has been quite difficult to select uh, a few participants. We cannot have webinars for many participants because really all the students who, has, who have passed by the summer school have been very, very interesting and having great and interesting careers. So we will look for having more opportunities to meet you, to let you meet our, our audience. And yes, you cannot get some conclusions because it's an open question, because uh, there is a lot of uh, discussion around. So you represent very different professions, uh, witnessing the fact that this is a complex problem. And uh, so it's, it's impossible to simplify <laughs> with, uh, with uh, some statements. And today we miss our director, Alexis Guzdil, who is always great at finding concluding words. I don't even try. I thank you all. <laughs> uh, we will have the next EMCDA webinar on uh, issues around prisons with uh, Linda Montanari as a chairman. So I will spread the link and I will share the information. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>